Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykantz, Superintendent of Schools. I often tell the principals that school and student safety and security is job one. Joining me today to talk about some of our efforts in the Needham Schools to improve student and school safety, Tamitha Bibble, our Pollard Middle School Principal. Thanks for being here, Tamitha. Tom Campbell, our Director of Human Resources, and our new Police Chief, John Schlittler. Welcome. And a, a special welcome and congratulations to you, Chief Schlittler, for uh, your new role. How, how's it been going so far? It's going great, and I thank you for having me here and, and for all the work that the schools have done, and Tom and, and Tabitha and, and Tamitha and um, all the staff at the school. It's such an important issue with school safety. Well, I, you know, you're here because I think we have really been very clear in the Needham Schools that we have to work together with our public safety officials to help um, think about, um, guide our efforts, and respond to student and, and school safety and security. And so I, I really appreciate your presence. I thought maybe we could begin, uh, Chief and, and, and Tom, with uh, maybe just talking a little bit of, about you know why this focus on security is is so important it may seem obvious and, and this work together that that we've done um, what is why is it important right now and 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 what are we doing together well I think you know if, when we look at it as from a police uh, department perspective we've always focused on our response and um, how we get there and how we respond inside the school and I think through the recent tragedies that have happened, we've actually leaned on the schools because one of our biggest thing is the schools itself, you're really worried about what's inside, the, the children inside and the staff and keeping them safe. And we want to be able to work with the schools and foster an environment in the schools that is it's productive and the, the children feel safe. And it's, it's not something that the police can do by itself, but it, it's in collaborative effort with the schools that can, can make that happen. And that's our, one of our main goals at the police department. And for us in the schools, <clears throat> you know, educating our students is the most important thing that we do in offering the very best educational uh, possibilities and opportunities. But uh, keeping kids safe really is very closely linked to that number one job. Um, and we all have to be aware and cognizant, and I think while we hope nothing ever happens in Needham, it's really most important that we're prepared. Um, and part of what we're going to talk about today is <coughs> about being prepared. Well, it, it, I, I know that uh, if, if students come to school, I think, Tom, something you said prompted this in me, that if they come to school and they feel uncertain or anxious, afraid, or, or unsafe, they're not prepared for learning. And, and at the same time, their parents as well, as they drop off their child, you know, to the bus stop or in, in the school, they, they want to have some level of understanding and, and uh, some, some level of um, uh, knowing that their child will, will be safe that day. And so we have to, you know, at a, at a basic level, we have to be able to provide for that. We can, can't guarantee that things won't happen, but we can reassure parents and students that we're trying to be prepared and, and responsive. Tamitha, you know, as a principal of, of a large middle school, uh, tell us a little bit about um, how, how safety and, and security is a priority for you. Well, well, Dan, I think you said it earlier, you know, our number one job is to keep children safe and, and adults safe. And we, we typically use that example when we talk about students being able to take intellectual risks in the classroom or feeling good about themselves and, and coming in and, and boosting their self-esteem so that they can learn. But really, we're also talking about them being physically safe, um, being happy to be dropped off in the morning, to not feel anxious or nervous about their environment. Um, you know, on any given day in any of our Needham schools, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of children in our buildings. Uh, and as a principal, I think it's a priority of ours to make sure that they're safe, that they're coming in, they know that the building is secure and safe, and they also know that we've done some planning for them, and we've thought about different scenarios, and that we've given them some practice and some routines around them. I think about the fire drills that we've done for years with children, um, or even we've practiced lockdown drills for a number of years, and I think that's some of the things we need to think about is what's happening in our world, and empower our staff and our students to feel as though they're knowledgeable, and that they have some skills and competencies um, to help in times of safety um, crises or issues that come about, but also know that we're keeping it on our mind, 
that it's not something that's far from what we do, and it's just as important, if not more important, and I think it's more important for my role in terms of what they're doing in the classroom, on the fields, um, and beyond. So it's incredibly important to us. Well, and you know, I, I, I hate that we even have to have the conversation, but, but it certainly is something uh, that's, that's important. Now, you know, one of the things that, that brings us to this present conversation, um, the reality of some recent tragedies, certainly those are on all of our minds, but going back just a couple of years, in fact, three years ago to Sandy Hook um, with the, uh, just the horrific tragedy of, of, of violence um, that occurred in that community. And then before that, uh, Virginia Tech. Um, and I know Tom and John, you have some more information about that, or some more details, but it seems to me that uh, certainly Sandy Hook, in my mind, prompted a, a need for this community to have a conversation about, is there a different way to think about school safety? Um, is there a different response that, that might happen? And um, we've had in place uh, for, for many, many years a lockdown procedure um, where we, we uh, tell the staff, lock the doors and turn off the lights and students sit quietly and, and securely in their classroom. But we're about to embark on something that, that uh, uh, begins with that, but perhaps doesn't end with that. And, and I think that's what I want us to talk about. Um, and that is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, protocol called ALICE. Uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you maybe to tell us what does ALICE stand for? Sure. And then Tom and, and John, how do, how do we get to that? And kind of unpack that a little bit for the community. Sure. So ALICE stands so for? So the acronym ALICE is ALERT. Uh, it is lockdown, inform, uh, counter and evacuate. So that's what ALICE stands for. It's a protocol that uh, was developed uh, well over a decade ago uh, by a police officer, I believe in the Midwest, who uh, his wife was a principal. Um, and after some of these school shootings, they took a very close look at what is our response, and it typically is to lock down, shelter in place, get, you know, get out of the way of the windows of the door and hide in the corner. They really started to look at and examine past school shootings, and this is a protocol specific to uh, a shooting. And what they looked at was uh, the data suggesting that um, the police, while very prompt and respond to those crises in a, in, a, in a very swift way, in many of these school shootings, the event is over by the time the police are actually on campus. They took a very careful look at Virginia Tech and they looked at very specifically the rooms where there were more casualties in this particular room versus this particular room and what was the difference. And the difference was the classrooms that did proactive strategies, blocking the door, making it difficult for the shooter to get into the room. Uh, classrooms where they went out the window, it was on the second floor, a number of students had broken limbs and so forth. But the survivor rate of the rooms where they took action was significantly greater than the survivor rate where they're huddled in, in the corner. And they really started to look at uh, the target, where if you're huddled in the corner and you have a, a person with a, with a weapon, you're setting a very easy target. Um, and they looked at the uh, success rate of trained police officers in a right. static, and John can speak a lot more than I can, you know, the success rate for a police officer in a, in a situation uh, is, um, is uh, police officers sometimes are successful in hitting the target, but not all the time. And they saw in these shootings where people were huddled, huddled the success rate of shooting was through the roof, it was significantly high, right. and, and John probably knows the stats. It was the high. accuracy rate is what they're talking right. about right. in terms, and um, the hardest, and we're police officers, when you're dealing with that, you're dealing with moving targets, and what they found out through these studies is that when they they go into the rooms and the, the kids are huddled in a corner, they're a static target, they're, they, they're just, they're not moving, so the hit rate or the accuracy rate is much higher, and as we've actually gone through this, and part of this, um, the ALICE protocol was um, as a result of the district attorney's office. Um, a st it, one of their school safety initiatives was, was having this program, because I think when we looked at it, and you looked after Columbine, our response was to surround and wait for SWAT. And looking through that, we've been able to determine that the actions that, not just the police officer, but the actions that the staff take at the school and, and how they respond to these has a huge impact 
on the outcome of, of these, these tragedies. So a combination of our response and then the response in the school, um, something had to change because it was very static and, and kind of almost um, follow the leader type and, and no change and there was no options. And this really is um, an option, Alice, that gives the teachers options, it gives the students options. They can think and make different decisions to to keep themselves safe. Well, we've for for years, and as a principal, and and, and Tom knows this as well. We we trained people. You listen to the directions of the main office or the principal, and and you will take your direction from from that person, and don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. This suggests that you may be making some decisions based on the information, the informed part, right. I believe, the communication right. part of Alice. Um, but that may be different than just sitting still. The other thing that happened recently, sadly, in, in Sandy Hook, is I read some of the final reports around Sandy Hook is that there were some teachers who decided to flee mm -hmm. the building and take shelter in a neighbor's garage or, or yeah. front yard or something with some of the children and that potentially may have uh, may have saved them because of that decision and I think it was that when I when I read about that that really helped me understand what Tom has been talking about and you've been talking about chief um, that we may need to think about a different a different way to go so Tom, why don't you, j for a moment, so, so what does it look like? What, what does Alice look like? If there is in the, the, the un certainly the unlikely um, and, and uh, awful event of, a, of an active shooter in a school, what is it that a principal or a staff member would do? So Alice, as uh, John alluded to, is provides different and other options for people. Rather than the response be you lock down and stay in your room, Really getting away from the situation is what we want to have happen. And the only way classrooms are gonna know is if we can provide information. So rather than using coded language like we were all taught in the past, you know, we may say uh, uh, the code silver, uh, which meant lockdown, it's being very explicit. Uh, it's giving people information so that they can make decisions. So if there is a gunman in the building and you know that, you can over the loudspeaker say, uh, alert, alert, there's a gunman in the building in the main lobby. You know, I think of big schools like Needham High School or Broadmeadow. If you're in the main lobby, there are classrooms way off to the end that they could think as one option, it's in the lobby, it could be safer for us to get out of this door and leave that situation. So it's about options. If you don't have the option to get away from and be safe and you have to lock down, it's really about barricading. It's about giving teachers and students the tools to say, don't just lock the door and go hide in the corner. Move any piece of furniture you can to keep that door as secure as possible. The research is pretty clear that individuals who want to do harm are there to do as much harm as they can. They're not going to spend 15 minutes trying to break down a door. They're going to try to move on to the next one. So it's given that option of blocking that door and keeping the intruder from coming in. Now tell me, I, I get that at the high school level or, or even in the middle school level. What about our little guys in elementary school? How, how does that fit in for yep, So for I think them? it's about differentiation to the age level um, and making sure that we know the developmental uh, levels of kids that we're dealing with. Although I would still suggest that if there's a crisis in the building that involves a gunman, we want for our kids to try to take some action, even if it's helping to move furniture and stack chairs up against the door. Um, but that's going to be up to the individual teacher, to those individuals. You know, you may have a high school student that uh, that's not their response. Their response is to withdraw and to go into the corner. That is okay. But other students may say, let's get this bookcase over. Let's get that desk right. over. So it really is about providing options. We're not going to make anybody do anything, but it's also giving teachers permission to make other decisions. You know, one example, when we were in training, we would never think of taking a chair and smashing out a window. Mm -hmm. A kid, a student Now, were you in training never, already? Yes. Yeah. You've been in training yes. so far. Okay. So it's, it's about giving permission. If you have to take a chair and smash a window to get yeah. out right. because there's a crisis going on in the other part of the building, that's okay. You can do that in that situation. I, I want to be really clear in this point, though, to make sure I understand and the community and families understand that in the event of a crisis or an emergency, typically the principal or whoever is designated to will get on and say, we're initiating a lockdown. And so the yeah. first thing, as I understand, even with this new protocol, Alice, we do lockdown and we await that communication to say what the next step may be. 
it's possible, you know, that you know we're, we're close to 128. Uh, if there were a chemical attack, a chemical spill or something, we would want students to be locked down. We mm -hmm. wouldn't want them fly, fleeing out of the building necessarily. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to do what we've always done, and that is to lock down, shelter in place, and await further instructions. The difference is that these instructions may suggest that you can take different actions now exactly. based on what we understand. Um, Tamitha, you, you said, I asked you if you've been, been trained. I believe the three of you yes. have gone through the, the ALICE training. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about what was, the, what, what was involved in the training. Sure. So uh, the training was a number of different folks. There were a lot of educators, a lot of police force, and a lot of people from local businesses um, and organizations that are getting trained on this protocol. The first day is a lot of um, education. So we're learning about the acronym. We're learning about what each step means and what it looks like and how it can be used in different ways. We learn about no more code silvers, no more Mr. Man is in the building. You know, be very clear and explicit. Uh, you know, we talk about what an enhanced lockdown means versus a, a traditional lockdown and the assumptions around the fact that the police will rescue you in time, that you just need to wait and sit and be calm. And it goes against our natural inclination to either flee or or, or fight or even to, to um, withdraw. And so we learn about all of these things. We also did a lot of work on case study and research and we looked at a number of um, really unfortunate tragedies that have happened in schools over decades and how all of them played out and the reactions and responses of the people in the building and outside of the building. Um, and so day one was, was really uh, a lot of reading, listening, learning in the classroom. Day two was a practical piece of it. So we went to a local high school and we actually were students of that high school and we were put into different scenarios at different times. If, if, there were an, if an active shooter were in the building, what would you do in this case? You're in this classroom, you're changing classrooms so that we could feel what our students would feel and empathize with what our teachers would empathize. What was the most powerful for us was um, they, the first exercise we did was a traditional lockdown. And so we were not allowed to do anything that we had just learned the day before, that's not the right thing to do and we had to do a traditional lockdown. And in that minute and a half that we were huddled under a desk together, the feeling of, um, of not being in power and waiting, it felt like hours in there. And, um, and then going through the process, it really helped to open our eyes and to really help us to see what our children would be experiencing um, if something like this were to happen. Of course, you can never replicate it, but it gave us a little bit of what that was like. So um, we felt leaving there that it was, em it was empowering, that it was incredibly informative. It does bring up a lot of feelings of anxiety teachers and educators do not go into this right. this job to think about scenarios like this. However, we're here to keep kids safe and to educate and to also be proactive and reactive to what's going on in our world. So how do we, how do we then train students, prepare students? Now I think there's been, um, a, there have been pilots of the Correct. ALICE protocol going on at, at Hillside and Mitchell and the high school. How do we prepare middle school students and staff for for this? It, it takes time. I, I will say that this... Are we training the middle school staff? Or we, we are. So currently we are, we are going through all of... Um, we were fortunate that the high school had started their work last year. So we're using their model of what they've done and gotten a lot of feedback from the adults in this building and the students to help us now roll it out to other schools and other grade levels, which has been incredibly helpful. Um, we are training staff starting in January in both middle school buildings. Uh, we have um, Chief Schlitter is going to come over and help us, and, and Dr. Campbell and uh, Aaron Seacott from the high school, and a few teachers are going to come. And we're really going to focus on taking all of this spring from January to June to really train our staff to do a similar training to what we went through, do the educational piece first, do the practical piece second, empower our teachers to look at the building, to think of creative ways. If I were in this classroom and it were happening here, what would I do? Um, and we're going to take a really good look at what our building has or what it may need to ensure that this would go well. Uh, I also know that we're going to be talking to the parents about it and families and that you'll be sending out some information. Uh, and we're thinking about for students for next year, really having some opportunities for students to also engage in conversations around the ALICE protocol 
and then to also practice this, just as we practice other drills, but in a very calm, safe way. Right. You know, we've heard that the high school recently went through this. We've learned a lot from their experience. We've gotten feedback from students about things that they really felt went well, and maybe some areas that we can improve upon, and then also make it appropriate for the age for seventh and eighth grade, and then obviously for sixth grade at High Rock. And that's where we are at the middle school level. Well, and of course, we, we'll have to, uh, as, as uh, Tom suggests, differentiate this for a developmentally appropriate response for first graders. Uh, so. It is, it, it reminds me that it is a shift, a bit of a paradigm shift for the adults. I think if we get the adults trained and on board with this, uh, they will help provide that guidance and direction for, particularly for our, our littlest students. But it's different because teachers are rule followers by nature, yes. uh, educators are, and we wait for instructions right. from the police mm -hmm. or the fire, and so this is really breaking with that. Um, and giving yourself permission to to do something uh, do something differently, Tom. Um, remind me again about the timeline. So we've got some people have been trained. We've done a pilot here. What, so we're from now till what happens? So a uh, number of our principals have been trained, and several are scheduled to be trained. Um, and once that takes place. We're going to do um, sort of in three phases. The first phase is really just having a conversation with faculty. What is Alice? What is not Alice? I think it's important to also talk about what the protocol isn't. And really allow people to become aware of Alice and be a little bit more comfortable with the concept. Phase two will be um, uh, you know, a, a training where we actually have a PowerPoint and going through all the specific steps. Uh, then it will shift to talking to students and training students, and it will end with the last phase, which will actually be um, practicing in the building, and that will uh, take place over a period of time. So we're looking at sort of January through June, really beginning the initial first phase um, of training the faculty. And again, some buildings are in a little different place. Yeah. The high school's further along than all the other schools. Uh, so by the end of June, the, the plan is to have it rolled out at least in sort of the soft launch um, with every one of our faculty in our building. We want to have some parent forums and speak to parents about it uh, as well. That will continue with phase two and three in the next school year. So we have a really deliberate, very careful, very thoughtful plan. Um, and I think Tamitha's right, the high school's been very helpful in their pilot in helping us to then structure that for the rest of the district. Um, Chief, I was, I was uh, you, you said earlier that the uh, district attorney's office is supportive of this effort, and, and, and Tamitha and, and, and Tom, you may know this as well, but what other communities are, are thinking about this or adopting this protocol? Um, I, I know at, at one point there was a discussion within the Needham administration that, well, let's adopt this, but let's not call it Alice. We'll, we'll <laughs> shape it into our own thing. And I think very quickly we said, we don't need to do that. Let's just be very clear and deliberate and borrow what seems to be working. But what other communities are, are involved in this? You know, I know the, the first one around here was Canton, was really took the first step in this. And they were one of the, the, the agencies that were behind getting this out to the other communities. Um, not only was it Norfolk County, but there were departments and, and school districts outside that are all looking at this. Um, it is a change of shift for us as well. I mean, our response, and you know, as a as a parent of a high school, a middle school, and an elementary, I we've put a lot of detail into this, and I was skeptical at first. Skeptical at first, and but then when you see you go through the training and you see it, you kind of take off that ego type thing. Oh, it's a police. This is not a police initiative. This is a, a town initiative. This is a collaborative of issue, and it's really something that it's. Like the schools have here, you kind of fight going back and forth. Is this something we want to do? But a lot of the communities around us um, are looking at the same thing or are trying a different initiative with pretty much the same response. So it's it's coming forward. And I think it, the more the tra excuse me tragedies that do happen, um, it's you know something that we're going to see in the future. As heartbreaking as a parent that this has to happen, but I'm also realistic that you have to be prepared and working together to do this is it's a change and shift and um, it's really a great step forward. 
Well, and I, we know it's certainly on the minds of, of a lot of folks. And I, you know, I was thinking, Tamitha, something you said about the, the little guys. We already have in the Needham schools, uh, through partnership with the community, and this is key, you said this, that we can't do this by ourselves. It's in collaboration with the police department, fire department, public safety officials, and the town manager's office. And I think in Needham, we, we pride ourselves in that, in that strength of relationship to make things happen. But we have the child abuse prevention program in our elementary schools. And I, I think for parents, what I would say is that in the CAP program or CAP program, we teach children to run away yes. from right. those strangers who yes. may strangers do them harm or whom they don't know. Yeah. And, and yet, what we've been doing in schools in an emergency is saying, stay put. Mm -hmm. This, in a way, is, is giving that permission that, that depending on the circumstances, you may run away. Um, and, and it's okay and actually the right thing to do to, to, uh, uh, to help save someone. So it's not something that's a brand new notion because we're already doing right. it in our elementary schools for the CAP program, but we're trying to really think differently, K through 12, for, for all, of our, all of our students. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, so we have uh, the, the ALICE program, ALERT, lock down, inform, counter, and evacuate that we are implementing in the, in the Needham schools. We're doing some, some folks have been trained, the three of mm -hmm. you have been trained, several administrators. More will be trained this coming winter and spring, and we look to um, implementing uh, uh, the program fully next year with some drills and, and further education of parents and students to really help um, reassure families and students that we're thinking very carefully about student safety and security. Even with all of this, there are no guarantees. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, there are things that will happen. I, I tell parents all the time that it's an imperfect world and we can't guarantee, but parents need to know that we think a lot about this and we have a strong relationship with public safety officials. I imagine I forgot to ask, the fire department is, is involved in this effort as well because they're also part of a response team. They are, and it's, it's more of when the schools were able to make the area safe that we do have fire response and we work with them and, on their response and working with us in, in more of a, a hostile environment or something environment that they're not used to. And we do collaborate with them and we do do some training um, in regards to that, their response and, and their efforts in, in this initiative. Well, in, in the Needham schools, what we're thinking a lot about is prevention. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we do that through our social emotional learning program with the assistance of guidance counselors and, and school psychologists and great teachers and principals who think about the children in front of them and think how they can help them through troubled times. Um, we have a great working relationship with the police and fire department, and so we, we think a lot about prevention. In this case, ALICE is our response that we are adopting. Um, we're we're uh, uh, excited to do so. Excited is probably not the right word in this mm -hmm. case, but. We think it's the right thing to do. We think it's best practice. And uh, I really look forward to our continued relationship with our new police chief and the police department. And uh, certainly, uh, Ms. Bibbo and Dr. Campbell, your continued leadership to, to help make sure that all of our schools are safe for, for our students and for learning. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.